Hello and welcome back to Jakubication. This is the first video of Chapter 0 entitled Straight Lines. Why that's the title, you won't know too much yet. By the time you watch the next video, it will make sense. A few background definitions. Programming is writing stuff for the computer to do. A bit like a recipe or driving directions. It's step-by-step -step instructions for the computer to accomplish a certain end goal. A programming language is a certain well-defined human-understood system for telling the computer to do a thing. There are many different programming languages. Comments. Little notes to yourself or other future readers of your code. This should remind you of the bigger picture of why your code is doing what it's doing. For example, once you get the basics down, you'll know x plus y, assuming x and y are numbers, is adding x and y. Your comment should say why you're adding these numbers. Many languages follow this style. Forward slash forward slash this is a single line comment or forward slash asterisk and then this is a multi-line comment or the asterisk isn't strictly necessary on every line. Some languages follow different styles. What is a variable? A username storage location with an associated value. What's a storage location? Memory, which almost everyone knows what memory is, where your variable lives. Thinking inside the box. A variable is conceptually a box. The variable's name is like a label piece of masking tape on the outside of the box. The variable's value is stored in the box. The variable's type limits what can be done to it, what kind of values it can hold. The variable's address is where it is stored in memory. Here's three different variables from three different languages, variable declarations. x equals 5, that's from Python. int x equals 5, that's from Java. And let x equals 5, that's from JavaScript. The value you want to put in the variable is always on the right. Why? You'll see that in a couple of slides. Declaration versus assignment. Declaration makes a variable exist while assignment puts a value in the variable. Depending on the language, declaring a variable and assigning it a value can be two different steps. The let. There can be information other than the variable type or name on the left side of the declaration. Assignment is right to left. Or the value on the right is put in the variable on the left. This is mainly because programming languages tend to stand on the backs of previous languages, so once one language did it, most languages took up that trend. So why did the first language do it? Honestly, people writing assembly languages had to choose one, and people eventually settled on the right to left as the way to do it. If the variable's name is a piece of tape on the outside of the box, the variable's value is what's in the box, and its memory address is where the box is, then where does the variable's type fit in all of this? Rest assured that no matter the language, the type is indeed stored at one point or another, but the kind of language determines whether or not the type is stored within the box or elsewhere. Here's an example of some code, x equals 1, y equals 2, x equals y. On that last line, y doesn't suddenly have no value in it. y's value is copied into x, so at that point, both x and y equals 2. Here's another example, a equals 1, b equals 2, c equals 0. Copy a's value into c, copy b's value into a, and copy c's value into b. This is code that swaps two numbers. Some words of caution. x equals 3 in the context of programming means something very different than what it means in the context of algebra. If you're familiar with algebra, you'll know x equals 3 means x equals 3. It most certainly does not mean that in coding. Equals always denotes assignment and always means puts the value on the right and the variable on the left. My examples will use variables with single letter names. Your variable names in practice should be meaningful so you remember what your code does. Primitive type versus reference type versus value type. A primitive type is a type that can't be broken into any simpler parts. Reference type is where the value in the box is the memory address of the value. And a value type is where the value is in the box. The interplay between value types and reference types is incredibly important. The difference between primitive types and value types? Primitive types are generally defined by the language they're in, and it's hard to make generalizations about them between all the languages. Value types are always just what their definition says, regardless of the language they're in. Some useful value types. Ints. Numbers without fractional parts. Your normal counting numbers. It includes negatives. Some examples. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. Floats. Numbers with fractional parts. Again, it includes negatives. Maybe called doubles or wrapped up in one big number category along with the ints. 
floats because the decimal point floats around. Chars, single characters of text. Example, the letter A. Some languages don't have this and just make you use strings for everything. Literals. When you place values directly in your code, they are called type literals, so int literal, char literal. Example, x equals 3. 3 is an integer literal, and that hashtag on that line, that's how you make a comment in Python. Another example, y equals hello. Hello is a string literal. Char z equals a. A is a character literal. Math. Most languages support your four basic operations right out of the box. Addition, x equals 2 plus 2, x now equals 4. Subtraction, x equals 4 minus 2, x now equals 2. Multiplication, x equals 4 times 2, x now equals 8. Division, x equals 8 divided by 4, x now equals 2. Most languages also support the remainder or modulo operator is the percent symbol. x equals 1 mod 3, x now equals 1, because when you divide 1 by 3, you have a remainder of 1. Watch where you swing that thing. Mixing types and mathematical operations can give you unexpected results. Some are simple and details you hardly ever have to worry about, while others can give you errors in your code. Plus sign. An int and an int equals an int. A float and a float equals a float. But if you mix an int and a float, you'll always get a float regardless of the order. The division sign. Int divided by an int gives you an int. Consequences of this means that 1 divided by 3 equals 0. To counteract this, make either one of the ints a float by making it int point zero. Operation and assign operators are a way of modifying a variable by one of your five basic math operators, then right away storing that value back in the same variable. These operators accomplish nothing new, they are just shorter to write in code. Plus equals. Example x plus equals 3. Add 3 to x and store it back in x. Minus equals. x minus equals 3. Subtract 3 from x and store it back in x and so on for the rest of your operators. On the accomplishing nothing new point, x plus equals 3 could be alternatively accomplished by doing x equals x plus 3. The rest of the operation and assign operators could similarly be accomplished like this. For plus equals and minus equals, some languages support an even shorter shorthand, that, that being x plus plus, plus plus x, x minus minus, and minus minus x. Those in order mean use the value of x and add 1 to it, Add 1 to x, then use its value. Use the value of x and subtract 1 from it. Subtract 1 from x and then use its value. Save for one other place in code, I tend to avoid using these altogether. Not completely understanding the concept or not thinking of how it will interact with other code can lead to dastardly hard to track down bugs. Please just use x plus equals 1 and x minus equals 1, except for the one other place I'll say plus plus or minus minus are good to use in. Strings. A string is an ordered collection of characters, chars. Depending on the language, strings may be mutable or immutable. This concept is tied to the value of reference type variables. In mutable, a value is able to be changed after it's created. In immutable, a value is unable to be changed after it's created. Strings and other immutable variables come with a certain caveat. When a string is immutable, you can't change it, but you can assign something different to the variable that holds the string. Example, x equals high. Now x equals high there. You've changed what the value of x is, but you haven't changed the string high itself. Escape characters. A sequence of characters that can be used to express something in a string that would either break the rules of the language if typed normally, or can't be typed with the keys on the keyboard. All prefixed with a backslash. I can never remember which one is called backslash and which one is called forward slash between those two. Think of horizontal left to right motion. The backslash seems to be going backwards. That's how you tie together backslash and backslash. Examples. Backslash n puts a new line in the string. Backslash t puts a horizontal tab in the string. And you can see how both of these work in this example on the side. The backslash t tabs between the hello and the world, and the backslash n puts that, the rest of that string on a new line. Backslash backslash puts a literal backslash in the string. Backslash quote puts a literal double quote in the string so the computer won't get confused and think you're closing the string early. Concatenation is joining two strings together. Most languages have it work like so. Example equals hi, y equals hi there. Z equals x plus y, so now z equals hi there. Using the plus sign, two strings are joined together. This again brings up an important point to remember, as depending on the context, the plus sign could be doing three-ish different operations. Three-ish because you have float addition or integer addition. 
This is also why comets are important, and without the bigger picture, it might be difficult to tell whether you can concatenate strings or adding numbers. Booleans, the last value type for now, named after George Boole, only two possible values, true or false. Check on the language you are using to see if you should capitalize these or not, it varies. In languages where you can convert these to ints, true converts to 1, and false converts to 0. When paired with logical operators, these are an important building block to be able to express yourself in code. Logical operators, the operators that can do operations on booleans. Three basic operators are and, or, and not. Some languages just let you write these words out lowercase to be the operator. <laughs> Other languages require the following symbols. And is double ampersand, or is double vertical bar, and not is exclamation point. Why these symbols? And linguistically makes sense. The ampersand is used to mean and. I couldn't find a consensus on the origin of or's symbol, but it seems plausible that it originated because of its role in BNF. I have BNF's Wikipedia page linked in the description, but exactly what it is or why it's important isn't important in this video. Not makes sense as well, because that symbol is half of how you express not equal to in many languages. Logical not. How to read this table. Given some Boolean variable P, if P is this one of true or false, this is what not P would be. So, true, P, not P, false. If P is false, not P would be true. Logical or. Given some Boolean variables P and Q, for some combination of P and Q being true or false, this is what P or Q would be. The only way P or Q is false is if they're both false. How to read this table for the logical and. Given some Boolean variables P and Q, for some combination of P and Q being true or false, this is what P and Q would be. P and Q is only true if they're both true. Comparison operators. Operators that take in two values, often ints and floats, and return a Boolean answer. All these operators are ones you're most likely familiar with from math. Greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, equal to, not equal to, Triple equals equals to, this is only applicable in languages like PHP and JavaScript where double equals brings great pain. All these operators take a value on the left, a value on the right, and return true if the statement is true and false otherwise. An example, x equals 5 greater than 3. 5 is greater than 3, so now x equals true. The horror of double equals, this is a Python example. Seems normal, right? High should equal high. Right? What on earth? You have two strings, you can pair high, it's true. You have two strings, you can pair high, it's false. This isn't wizardry, but exactly why this is, is out of scope for now. The big picture for now is, double equals works the way you think it would for value types, but can have weird quirks come up for reference types. Stay tuned for the next video, where I'll cover conditionals. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is the next video of chapter 0, entitled, Conditionals. Some background definitions. A statement is a unit that expresses some action to be carried out. A unit, because it can be a simple, single-line statement, or be composed of many single-line statements that join together to form a single unit. An example, a simple statement is just x plus 3, an assignment statement. A compound statement, you don't know any useful ones of these yet. An expression is a unit that can be evaluated to determine its value. A unit, because it can be a simple single value or be as many values as you want, joined together with operators. A simple expression, just the number 3. A compound expression, hello plus space plus world. Scope is where variables can be seen in a program. In some languages, if you declare a variable in an if statement, that variable can't be seen outside of the if statement. If statement. The overarching concept is, do some statement or statements if some condition is true. The anatomy of an if statement, the if, the word itself, it's always there, Boolean value, the condition you're checking, and actions, the statements to perform if the Boolean value is true. An if statement is a statement because it joins together the simple statements of the Boolean value and the actions into one larger compound statement. Real life example. Telling this to someone going to a store, Get ketchup if they have it. The condition is whether or not the store has ketchup. The action is getting the ketchup. Flip a coin. This is a program that tells the user the result of a coin flip. The result is H. If the result is H, the answer is head. If the result is T, the answer is tails. 
This is arguably poorly designed. You either flip a head or tails. This code asks if you flip to tails, regardless of you already flipping a head being true. This will never be the case, so there has got to be a better way to express this idea. And, side note, the previous video's title was Straight Lines because of the indentation of conditionals and other similar statements. If you look at the example, there's indentation. Else statement. This is a program that's a flip of the last one where instead of if result equals h, if result equals t, it says if result equals h, else. An else statement must be paired with an if or else if statement above it. Expresses that if the conditional above it has evaluated to false, then do the actions that are associated with the else statement. This is better designed. If you haven't flipped a heads, you've obviously flipped tails, so you don't have to ask again. The else statement accomplishes this. Extending the ketchup example. Get ketchup if they have it. Otherwise, do this. The otherwise is the else. Stacking ifs. These are two programs that say if the number equals the numeric value, the answer equals the string version of that number. Basically, only ever do this if you're asking questions whose answers will never have any overlap, like flipping a coin, rolling a die, etc. In the ketchup example, you're making many different food requests. If the store has ketchup, if the store has mustard, if the store has relish, if the store has hot dogs, if the store has barbecue chips. The else in this program on the right here gives you unexpected results, as in this case, it will always fire if the statement evaluates to false, meaning, on the right example, if the number isn't 5, the answer will always be string 6. So code the way on the left. Else if statement. In Python, it's abbreviated to elif. If the above if or else if statement evaluated to false, evaluate this statement. Comes with a bonus. Once one condition evaluates to true and its corresponding statements are ran, execution continues past the if, else if, else ladder. Call it a ladder because it's one solid thing and you move down the rungs as the conditions evaluate to false. Ketchup example. It's a contingency for the absence of ketchup. This program on the bottom right here is a grade scale that I had in high school. If your grade's greater than a 92, it's an A. Else if it's not greater than a 92, if it's greater than an 84, it's a B. If it's greater than a 76, it's a C. LF, if it's greater than a 69, it's a D. Else, it's an F. If you didn't have the LFs there, if you got an A, you would also get a B, C, D, and F because there's no signal to stop early. And in this case, with the ketchup example, it's similar. You don't have to keep going to the store and going down your list of contingencies if they already have the ketchup. Ladder. An if, else if, else ladder should be understood as one solid thing because you can't write any non-conditional statements between the else if statements. As you're going through catch-up contingencies, putting statements between these contingencies will be breaking up a complete thought. Similarly, an if statement not connected to else if or else statement is one solid thing. Therefore, you can put any number of statements between stacked if statements. The latter can also be made of as many else if statements as you want as long as the latter starts with an if. Ending the ladder with an else is entirely optional. Many times, ending the ladder with an else can be bad design because you're willfully ignoring an error case that couldn't possibly happen. Fizzbuzz modified. A popular children's game where, in my version, if the number is multiple of 3, the answer is fizz. If the number is multiple of 5, the answer is buzz. And if the number is multiple of 3 and 5, the answer is fizzbuzz. Citing the answer to fizzbuzz multiple times will be the first time you've seen the popular theme in coding. If you're copying code, you're probably designing your code poorly. In this example on the bottom, you're setting the answer to fizzbuzz multiple times. Nesting ifs versus ands, or the double ampersand. Nesting ifs can be trivially replaced by just joining the two separate conditions with an and like so. In this example, if the number is multiple 3 and it's multiple 5, the answer is fizzbuzz. Else, if the number is multiple 3, the answer is fizz. Else, if the number is multiple 5, the answer is buzz. Not to say avoid all nesting at all costs, though. Like many things in life, it's a balance, and nesting has a time and place. The balance. This checks eligibility for U.S. federal offices, and it greatly simplifies the Constitution, as it just says, are you a citizen, what's your age? 
on the left example, if you are a citizen that nests and then asks you the age question for the various things, and on the right example, asks every time, are you a citizen and what's your age? Are you a citizen and what's your age? I would say the nesting looks cleaner here, as you're not asking, are you a citizen four times? The balance is, try not to ask the same question over and over again, and nesting deeper than three levels gets stupid to handle and think about. Use of the or or double bar. This finds if a letter is vowel or consonant. If it's an A or an E or an I or an O or a U or a Y, it's a vowel, else it's a consonant. This brings up another theme in coding. If you go much past column 80 on a single line, you should write the line differently. Yes, there is a way to make this code shorter. No, you don't know the best way to do this yet. Switch statement. This is a JavaScript example. The expression between the parentheses and the case work together. So in this case, the OP, the operation variable, and what's in the case variables are compared. So if the plus sign equals the plus sign, add the two numbers. If the minus sign equals the minus, if operation equals the minus sign, subtract the numbers. If operation equals the multiplication sign, multiply the numbers, and so on. The break ensures that one true exits the entire switch statement. The default happens when all other cases are false, or happens last if no breaks are used, because if no breaks are used, it goes through every single statement, like your stacking ifs. Use of not, or the bang operator, can be used to factor out nesting, but generally it's better to use different operators or refactor logic. This is the eligibility example again. If you're not a citizen, you're not a citizen. Otherwise, you are a citizen, so we can ask you the age questions. Short-circuiting has to do with and or or. In an if statement, if the first Boolean value in an and is false, the second is not evaluated. In that bottom example, if you don't have the money, thirsty is never checked. If the first Boolean value in an or is true, the second is not evaluated. If the letter is an A in that top example, none of the other Boolean conditions are checked. De Morgan's Laws Named after British mathematician Augustus de Morgan, these two laws prescribe how a not distributes across an or or an and. Not A and B becomes not A or not B. Not A or B becomes not A and not B. Basically, a distribution of a not flips the logical operator to the other one. The issue number one that comes up with ifs is optionally omitting curly braces. This doesn't come up in Python. In languages like C, C++, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, PHP, etc., where if statements are surrounded by curly braces, you can optionally omit the curly braces if your if, else if, else statement is less than a single line. This doesn't come up in Python because by it trading force indentation for curly braces, they're not an option to omit anything. There's hardly ever any upside to this, and more often than not, it's bad because if you later go back and add code, then your if statement won't function like it's supposed to. An example. On the left, it's your coin flipping example again. And on the right, you add a tally that if you flip to heads, you increment the heads value, and if you flip to tails, you increment the tails value. This code on the right functions like the tallies were written at the end of the ladder as, regardless of what you flip, both values get incremented. Issue number two is the dangling else. And this follows from optionally omitting curly braces. The else will match the nearest if, regardless of the indentation. Like the left and right examples, they're the same code, but regardless of the indentation, that else always matches with the if the age is greater than or equal to 35. Seriously, just use the dang curly brace. In the next video, we'll cover loops. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is the next video of chapter 0 entitled Loops. A background definition. Iteration is doing something over and over again. Also, everything a loop does in a single run through can be called one iteration of the loop. Another definition, syntax, is a set of rules that define which arrangement of symbols are considered correct versions of a certain statement or expression. Specific to each language, example, and this is nearly universal to all languages, an assignment statement has a variable and then an optional number of values on the right. While loops, overarching concept, ask a question, if the answer is true, do the subsequent conditions, then ask the question again, repeat this until the answer is false. Example, 
while i is greater than zero, add one to j, subtract one from i. i is greater than zero ten times, so j equals ten at the end of the loop. Infinite loops. The question asked never gets answered as false, so the loop goes on forever. Normally, control c is the magic key combination to stop an infinite loop if you accidentally encode it up. Simplest example, while true x equals five. Do while. Feature only in some languages that is essentially a while loop with the added bit of functionality that the first iteration always runs, regardless of the condition you are checking. So this is the same as the last example on the right here, except the first run always completes without checking if i is greater than zero. Yes, the syntax is weird and I never remember it. Break statement. Break out of loop or a switch statement before the loop is supposed to end. So in this example on the left, if i is less than or equal to 5, then it breaks out of the loop early, and then j only gets to 5. Continue statement. Continue the next iteration of loop, possibly skipping parts of a loop. In this example, j doesn't get incremented if i is a multiple of 2. Nested loops. Do the entire inner loop for every iteration of the outer loop. So in this case, j gets iterated 10 times for every iteration of the outer loop. So j happens 100 times because there's a multiplication relationship between the inner and the outer loop. C and descendant style for loop. The same main concept from while loops applies. The loop continually executes until the condition is false. Anatomy, initialize step, initialize a counter variable, like let i equals zero, condition, in this example, i less than 10, increment step, i plus plus. This is the only place I'd use the plus plus and the minus minus, as they have hardly no way of messing up in this case, and they work without any nasty side effects. The initialize step only runs once. The condition runs at the start of each iteration, so at the start of each iteration of this for loop, it checks if i is less than 10. The increment step runs at the end of each iteration, so at the end of each iteration, it adds 1 to i. Which one to choose? For loops and while loops seem to accomplish the same end goal, that being looping through stuff. So when should you use for loops and when should you use while loops? Use while loops when you don't know in advance how many iterations you want to do. Use for loops when you do know in advance how many iterations you want to do. In the next video, I'll cover arrays. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is the next video in chapter 0 entitled Arrays. Some background definitions. An abstract data type is a type whose set of possible values and set of operations that can be done with it exists separate of its implementation. A data structure is the implementation of an abstract data type. The general concept of an array, or the array ADT, exists across all languages. Most languages have their own array data structure, meaning their own implementation, which is why arrays across different languages have different features. The definition. An array is an ordered sequence of values of the same type. Key features. Values in arrays are contiguous, or right next to each other in memory. The array variable is a reference type that holds the memory address of the first element of the array. Once an array is declared, the array itself doesn't have a built-in way to add more elements past the end of the array. It depends on the language whether or not the array has a built-in way to figure out its length, where its length is the number of elements in an array. Declaration, this is a C example. You can declare it in C as type, name, square brackets, length. Or, optionally omit the length and provide an initial array surrounded by curly braces and values separated by commas. The resulting array's length will be the length of the initial array you provided. The example, first example, type, name, length, in T5. The second example, the length will be 5, in S. This is the Java example. In Java, all declarations must omit the length. The initial array still works like it does in C, and makes its length your array's length. To mimic C's type name bracket length, you now how have to do type name brackets equals new type brackets length. Java also offers a different, in my opinion, cleaner way to declare an array. 
type bracket name equals new type bracket length. The type in square brackets being closer looks cleaner to me. And down below you can see all of these. The type name equals brackets equals new type brackets length. The initial array and the cleaner Java version. Access. You can access any value in an array at any given time. Meaning you don't have to see the first and second values before you see the third value. This is called random access. Why? Shouldn't it be arbitrary access? Because it's not like you access a random spot in the array every time. Basically it's called random because values can be found regardless of the order you want to retrieve them in. Arbitrary access is probably a better way to think about it because you can access values very fast regardless of where they are in the array. Access, the zero reason. To access some value in an array you do name, square brackets, numeric value less than the length of the array. The number to access the first value in an array is zero. Why? Array access is so fast because all you're doing is a math calculation with addition and multiplication. The formula Desired values address equals start of array's address plus size of an individual value in an array times value slot number. Slot number can also be called index. Accessing a certain value and a certain index is called indexing. So if you want to access the first value, you want to add zero to the start of the array's address. To make a multiplication result in zero, one or both values have to be zero. The size of an individual value in an array being zero would be nonsensical, as it would be an array of no size, meaning the array itself wouldn't even exist. Therefore, the slot number or index of the first value would have to be zero, as that's the only other way you could add zero to the start of an array's address. Out of bounds access. Out of bounds access is when you try to access an element before the first element or after the last element. Some languages like C and C++ just expect you to know not to do this and it won't stop your code if you do this. Accessing arrays out of bounds in these languages is defined to be undefined behavior, meaning the language gives you no guarantee what will happen if you do this. Other languages, like Java, stop your code as it's running if you do this. This is an example that sums up numbers. Y, I, J, and K for variables to increment in the for loop. As the variable won't exist outside of the for loop, you don't have to give it a meaningful name. And there's a long history of mathematics of using I, J, and K as matrix indices, which eventually the developers of Fortran took up and the rest of the languages took their cue from Fortran. In this example on the right, you're declaring the array 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You're initializing the sum to 0, and then in this for loop, you're going through every value and then adding the value at the ith slot to the sum, and then the numbers 1 through 5 add up to 15 at the end. Get and put. The previous example illustrated one of the two main operations you can do with an array, getting a value from the array. Sum plus equals s sub i gets the value from slot i and adds it to the sum. The other main operation is putting a new value in the array. s sub 0 equals 5 puts 5 in the first position in the array. Higher dimensional arrays. Arrays are frequently used in their one dimensional state. They can be as many dimensions as you want. For some array of dimension n it can be thought of as an array of arrays of arrays of arrays of dot dot dot, with a repetition of that statement being as much as n. Much more than two-dimensional arrays is hardly ever needed. 2D arrays can be thought of like a grid or matrix. 2D array. C has very specific rules for declaring higher dimensional arrays, so I'll give you a Java example. When you access 2D arrays, you use two numbers with the first being the row and the second being the column. So on the right here is a visualization of the array R and the little arrow is showing you which one is I and which one is J. So when you're going through the double loops, you're accessing row zero of I and then column zero, column one, column two of J. And eventually you add up the numbers one through nine and you get to 45. Arrays as reference types. Big important concept. The value that's in the array variable is the memory address of the first array element. When you copy this value into another variable, without deeper thinking, you're tempted to think you've got a whole new array. You do not! All you have is a copy of the memory address pointing to the first value in the original array. If you change a value in the second array, both arrays are changed the very same. 
In this example down here, you make an initial array, one, two, three. You copy that array into a new array variable. You change the second element to 12 in the new array. And now both of the arrays, their second value is 12 because you just gave yourself a new arrow to the start of the first array. You didn't make a new array. The double equals again. The major languages, except for Python, treat using double equals on reference types as asking the questions. Are the memory addresses that these two variables are holding the same? That's why in the example below, two identical arrays don't equal each other. To check the human sense of equal, you would have to go through both arrays one by one and make sure all the values matched up, like the ones were equal, the twos were equal, the threes were equal, and so on if you had bigger arrays. In the next video, we'll cover functions. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is the next video in chapter zero entitled Functions. A function is a group of code packaged together with a certain name. Note, there are many other different terms that are similar to a function like routine, subprogram, subroutine, method, or procedure. These have specific meanings and specific ways they work in the languages they're in. This video will focus on the umbrella concepts of functions without diving into specific terms. Add two numbers examples. As it says, this adds two numbers and returns the result. Many languages have a keyword to let you know you're starting to define a function like def in Python and function in JavaScript. The name of the function, it was add in the example on the previous slide. You give the function a name so you can use it later. Inputs, num1 and num2 in the example. Some languages also make you state the type of the inputs as well as their names. Two different terms for these inputs that are used interchangeably but shouldn't be. Parameters are the name of the inputs when you define the function, and arguments are the name of the inputs when you call the function. Body of a function, the code you're packaging up so you can use it multiple times. General rule of thumb in coding, if you're writing the same bit of code over and over again, you should be using a function. Functions should generally only do one thing, but as you get more complex programs, what one thing is becomes blurry. So just be sure you're not trying to accomplish multiple different goals in the same function. Turn statement. Can use return by itself to exit a function early. A function that only uses the return statement by itself and doesn't return a value is called a void function. Why is it called void? I didn't find any historical reason, but the dictionary ties void to meaning the absence of stuff, so it makes sense. Generally used to give a, meaning you can't get back more than one value from a function to the original place that it was called. In some languages, the type of the return value has to be specified within the function definition. Calling a function. Calling a function means to pause execution on the current bit of code you are executing and begin to execute this new piece of code. This jumping around seems like it will get messy and hard to follow in about 10 seconds. Programming to the rescue. Main function. Many languages define the main function as where your code will start. In some languages that have the main function, using it is optional, like Python. In some languages, the main function is called on its own. In the other languages, it's not. In this example on the side here, you define two numbers, one and two, and then you call the add function with one and two. So you pause execution in main, you go into add, you add one and two, it gives back three, and then answer one is three. And then answer two is calling subtraction with two and one. So you pause execution to main again, you go to the subtraction function, you subtract two and one, you return one, answer two is equal to one. And then answer three, you call the multiplication function with two and one. You pause execution to main again, you go to the multiplication function, you multiply two and one, you return two, and then you're done in main. Scope within functions. Pretty much skipping over this for now because you need to know a later concept for this to be explained well. For now, variables only exist within the function they're defined in. Recursion. In programming, recursion is when a function calls itself. The useful bits of this I'm going to skip over for the same reason as the previous slide. The below example is an example of infinite recursion. This function is similar to an infinite loop as it never ends, so you can press Control c to stop it. Printing. No, Hewlett Packard, I'm not talking about you. When you're coding, it's often useful to print values to the screen. 
it varies wildly from language to language what it's called and how you can use it. So for now, I'll show you a simple Python example that just prints hello world to the screen. Pass by value, swap example. The example below demonstrates pass by value. You call the swap function from main with the two numbers. You swap them in the swap function, but then when you return from the swap function, the numbers aren't swapped. And that's what this example does. Pass by value. Copies of values are passed to the functions, not the values themselves. And this is why the example doesn't work like you expected. You didn't pass num1 and num2 into the function, actually. You pass copies in num1 and num2. Pass by reference. Swap example the correct way. Pass by reference is the memory address of the values are passed to the function on the set of copies of the values. Generally, unless you use language feature to opt in to pass by reference, pass by value is used. This makes the swap function properly, as now you're manipulating memory that won't disappear when you return from the function. Don't worry about the C syntax, just know you're passing memory addresses in for main and manipulating the variable's memory addresses in the swap function. Side effects. This is a term I have particular disdain for because the medical connotation immediately pops up and you think it's bad to have side effects in your code. It's not bad. Side effect is when a bit of code, function or otherwise, modifies state out of its local environment. Examples, modifying variables out of the scope of the current function using the print function. In the next video, I'll cover stacks and recursion. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is the next video of chapter zero entitled Stacks and Recursion. Stacks. A stack is an abstract data type that is a collection of items with two operations, push and pop. The stack ADT is LIFO, or last in, first out, meaning the most recent item placed in the stack will be the first item to leave. Push adds an element to the stack, and pop removes an element from the stack. With just this definition, you're tempted to say, who cares about this abstract thing? This and other ADTs play roles in solving certain types of problems. Palindromes. A palindrome is a word or phrase that is spelled the same forwards and backwards. You can see if a word is a palindrome using a stack. Basic solution. Have a copy of the initial word. Push letters of word one by one onto the stack. Pop all the letters back out and collect them into a new string in the order they are popped out. If the new string in the previous copy matches up, then the word is a palindrome. Animation 1. Ball. Add B-A-L-L -L to the stack. Pop them off, remake the string. You'll get lab. Lab doesn't equal ball. Ball is not a palindrome. B A L L L L A B. The lab doesn't equal ball. Ball is not a palindrome. Race car. Add R A C E C A R to the stack. Pop them off and remake the string. Race car. Does equal race car. Race car is a palindrome. R A C E C A R. R A C E C A R. Race car is a palindrome. Revisiting variable function scope. Stacks were the concept I previously alluded to that you needed to know to understand this. The computer itself in most languages has a stack that stores stack frames. A stack frame is added to the stack when a function is called. It stores arguments and variables local to the current function you're in, and the current function itself. Def main, x equals add 1, 2, return, add a, b, return a plus b. Call main. Main is added and it says x is going to be the result of calling the add function with 1 and 2. You pop another stack frame on with the add function and it tells you you're going to return 3. 3 is given back x now equals 3. The add function has no concept of the x variable. Therefore, variables most of the time only exist in the function they're defined in. One exception is global variables that you declare outside of any functions. Global variables can be anywhere from frowned upon to totally disallowed by a language. The other exception is block scoped variables depending on if the language supports it. For example, a variable defined in an if block only exists within the if block. Revisiting recursion. The only thing different between that palindrome example and recursion is who's using a stack. In recursion's case, the computer is using a stack. Recursion relies on a function having two things, a recursive case and a base case. 
Recursive case, the part of the function where it is still calling itself. Base case, the part of the function where the answer to this call is known trivially. The stack can start popping frames off at this point. The following examples will be either examples of single or multiple recursion. Single recursion can often be easily replaced with a loop. Factorial. The classic recursion example, factorial of 5, is demonstrated. Factorial 5, you return factorial 4 times 5. You gotta do the function call before you can return anything, so you call factorial 4. Factorial 4, return factorial of 3 times 4. Again, you gotta do factorial 3 first. Factorial 3, return factorial of 2 times 3. Again, you gotta do the function call first. Factorial 2, you return factorial 1 times 2. Again, function call first. Factorial 1, you return 1. You hand the answer back of factorial 1 to the previous function. Return 2. You hand that answer back to the previous call. You return 6. You hand that answer back to the previous call. You return 6 times 4, 24. You return that answer back to the previous call. And factorial 5 ends up equaling 120. Reversing a string. Reversing cat. Single recursion again. You do T plus reverse CA. A plus reverse string of C. C plus reverse string of empty string. Reverse string of empty string. You return the empty string back. You return C. A plus C. You return A plus C to T, and you end up returning T A C because that's cat backwards. Multiple recursion. In multiple recursion, a function can have multiple calls to itself within one call of the function. This means the function ends up following the first call first. Then when a base case is reached, the second call is later followed as stacks frames are being pushed off. Fibonacci. If n equals 0, return 0. L, if n equals 1, return 1. Else, return Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus Fibonacci of n minus 2. We're going to demonstrate Fibonacci of 3. This gets inefficient because you're asking the same question more than once. Fibonacci of 3, you got to return Fibonacci of 2 plus Fibonacci of 1. So go to the left call first. Fibonacci of 2 is Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci of 0. Left call first again. Fibonacci of 1 is 1 and give that answer back. You got to call Fibonacci of 0. Fibonacci of 0 is 0. Give that call back. Fibonacci of 2 is 1. Give that call back. Now you got to work out what Fibonacci of 1 is again. Fibonacci of 1 is 1. Give that answer back. Fibonacci of 3 is 2. Final note on recursion. The utility seems hazy at best, I know. At this point, your best bet is understanding the concepts, not remembering how these examples worked out. In the next video, I'll cover cues. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is the next video of Chapter 0 entitled, Cues. A queue is an abstract data type that is a collection of items with two main operations, in queue and dequeue. The QADT is the other side of the stack coin as it works as FIFO, or first in, first out, instead of the stack's LIFO. In queue adds an element to the back of the queue. DQ removes an element from the front of the queue. An example? Just a single example because the concept is important, but uses that come up are few and far between. The first unique letter in a word. In queue every letter. If the queue only has zero or one letters, add the next letter. If the two letters in the queue are equal, DQ. Else, the answer is what you DQ. Animation 1 for the word ball. B. There's only one in there. Add another one. A. They're not equal. DQ. B's your answer. Now on AA Ron. Add A. Only one in there. Add another A. They're equal. DQ both of them. Add R. There's only one in there. Add O, DQ, R's your answer. In the next video, I'll cover maps. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is a video on associative arrays. An associative array is an ADT that stores a collection of key value pairs, where keys must be unique. 
nicknames, map, symbol table, dictionary. Key feature, highly efficient lookup. As fast as a math calculation, you don't have to go through the entire array at worst to find a certain item. Don't worry about the nitty gritty details with this data structure, just use what a language is already provided. Read, don't implement your own associative array. Example, this maps programming languages to ages in Python. C to 50 years old, C++ to 37 years old, Python to 31 years old, Java to 27 years old. And then you access the dictionary, the Java key, and you get back the Java's age is 37. Practical example. The English language has somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 words. Imagine you had to spell check the following sentence. Zoos have many zygotes. They have many cameras for proper zooming. Obviously, you can tell as a human that zooming is spelled incorrectly, but a computer would have to check that somehow. You might make a choice between putting all the dictionary's words into an array or an associative array. With the associative array, you do 11 quick lookups. With the array, simplifying the math and assuming the dictionary is evenly divided between the words and that a word starting with some letter has no distance from that letter itself, you do a million two hundred seventy thousand five hundred lookups. Assuming each lookup is a nanosecond, associative array would take 1.1 times 10 to the negative 8 seconds, and an array would take 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. Takeaway. How you store your data to solve a problem in computing is incredibly important. Next video I'll cover, objects and classes. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is a video about objects and classes. A class is a user-defined type that defines the variables this type should have and the functionality the type should have. Objects are instances of the class. Think of it like this. Classes are how, while objects are what. Members, variables belonging to the class. Methods, function belonging to the object that gives the object's functionality. Access qualifiers, determine where your members can be accessed. Private, can only be accessed within the class. Public, can be accessed anywhere. Protected, can only be accessed in the file the class definition is in. Pair example. This defines a class with two numbers in a midpoint method that determines the midpoint between two pairs. And you take the midpoint between 4, 1, and 10, 5, and you end up getting 7, 3. Getters and setters. Method designed to access or modify members if they are private. Constructor. Method that has a return type of the class itself and makes it easier to set up an object. Pair refine. Now it has a method get num1 that returns num1 because num1's private. It has a method where you can set num1 and there's a typo in that one. Num1 should be set to num, which is the argument I have in the function. And then the constructor pair n1, n2, you set n1 and n2 to num1 and num2. In the next video, we'll cover composition and inheritance. Ciao. Hello and welcome back to Jacubication. This is a video about composition versus inheritance. Composition is a way of designing classes that involves putting other classes or real life primitives together. This is a has a relationship. Inheritance is a way of designing classes that involves using a logical hierarchy. Is a relationship. Inheritance example. You have a parent class shape where you have a num sides member in two methods, area and print sides. And then you have a class that inherits from shape, circle, which has a radius member and inherits the num sides member. And also inherits the print sides method. And then it overrides the area function to calculate the proper area of the circle. And then you have a square class that also inherits from the shape class and also inherits the num side member and the print sides method. And it also overrides the area method to calculate the area for a square. And then down here, you make a circle, you make a square, you print how many sides they have, and then you calculate their area, which ends up being 50.24 and 144. Circles and squares are shapes. That's your overarching concept for inheritance. They inherited the num sides member and the print sides method. They both override the area method to give a specific answer for how to find the area for the specific shape. This is a composition example. It's a fraction class. A fraction has a numerator and denominator. It has a constructor where if you don't give the first argument, the numerator is zero. 
And if you don't give the second argument, the denominator is 1. And then, in all the other cases, the numerator is just what you pass in. The denominator is what you pass in. So the first one, you pass in 1 and 3, so that's 1 third. The second one, you pass in 3, so it's just 3. The, sec the third one, you pass in nothing, so that fraction is 0. The overarching concept here is that a fraction has a numerator and denominator. Next video, we'll cover programming style. Ciao. Welcome back to Jacubication. This video is about style. Style conventions are guidelines for a specific language that recommend a way for your code to appear. These are recommendations, but the most important thing when it comes to style is consistency. If you're adding the code that is already existing, stay with the style that it has rather than imposing new style. People get nearly religious about style preferences. Again, consistency over all else. Single line conditionals, curly braces. Curly brace languages requ don't require you to put a set of curly braces around conditionals or loops that are only a single line. It's best to do it anyways. It can help prevent errors that come from adding stuff later to a conditional and forgetting to add the curly braces. Curly brace placement. Curly brace languages have various functionalities that require curly braces. Functions, conditionals, loops, structs, classes. My preference is putting curly braces on their own line like below. If you see below, the for loop has curly braces on its own line. Tabs or spaces. My preference to indent code is tabs. Python recommends four spaces. Column 80. Code that stretches past column 80 should be broken into multiple lines. Operators and line breaks. If an operation is broken over multiple lines, say addition, you should break the line before the operator and you should line up the operators, which this example below does both of them. It breaks the line before the plus and then it lines up the pluses. Variable naming. Two main styles. Camel case where every word after the first word is capitalized and snake case where every word after the first word is separated with an underscore. In the next video, I'll cover number bases. Ciao. Welcome back to Jacubication. This video is about number bases. A number base is a number of digits or combination of digits that a system of counting uses to represent numbers. Example, base 10 is the number system you're familiar with. 10 digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. How bases work. Place value from elementary school. Swap out 10 in this chart here with any other number and you'll have yourself a different base. Hexadecimal. Hex and death. The word itself contains 10 and 6, or 16. Base 16. Introduce 6 new digits. A, B, C, D, E, and F. All a digit really is is some symbol that represents a certain amount. Resist the urge to say, but that's a letter. Context matters to know what the symbol means. Example. You've probably seen hexadecimal before if you've ever used a color picker. Hashtag FFFFFF is the color white. Hashtag 000000, it's the color black, and hashtag 00CC00, it's the color of Link's tunic in the original Legend of Zelda. Why hexadecimal? It gives you more space to convey information with less digits. Take the colors, for example, assuming the same number of digits. In decimal, you could convey a million colors, because there's 10 different choices and 6 different slots, so that's 10 to the 6. In hexadecimal, you could convey... 16,777,216 colors, because it's 16 options and 6 slots, so 16 to the 6th power. Binary, the meat and potatoes of computers. All of the data in your computer is stored in 1s and zeros. Electricity going through a circuit or not is way easier to quantify compared to how much electricity is going through a circuit at a given moment. But down here you have... 1101001, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, which you do the math to add it all up, that's 211 in binary. Back to context. Given that bases share digits, how do you tell which base you're working in? Hash, you'll seek for hexadecimal colors. 0x, you'll see for hexadecimal and programming. 0b, you'll see for binary and programming. The other way you'll see to do it, surrounding a number in parentheses and putting the base to the right outside of the parentheses like 010 in base 2, or beef in base 16. In the next video, I'll cover bitwise operators. Ciao. Welcome back to Jacubication. This video is about bitwise operators. 
intro, operators, and programming that work on numbers at the binary level. List, bitwise and, bitwise or, bitwise xor, bitwise not. I won't cover shifting operators here because they vary depending on the language. Bitwise and, you have 10001110011100111. Two numbers bitwise anded together only form a one if they are both one, and that only happened in one slot, so it becomes in decimal two or in binary 00000010. Bitwise or, two numbers or together only form a zero if they're both zero. So that happened nowhere if you bitwise or these two numbers together, so it's just all ones. Bitwise XOR, two numbers bitwise XOR together form a zero if they're both the same, i.e. they're both one or both zero. So that number came out to be 11111101. One, 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 one. Bitwise not, a number bitwise knotted flips all the ones to zeros and zeros to one. So one zero 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 one 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 zero came out to be zero one 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 zero 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 one. Next video, there is none in this series. It's the end of the intro series. Ciao.